Savior of the lost, whose precious blood redeemed me at such tremendous cost. Thy righteousness, thy pardon, thy precious blood must be my only hope and comfort, my glory and my plea. I could not do without thee, I cannot stand alone. I have no strength or goodness, no wisdom of my own. But thou, beloved Savior, art all in all to me. And weakness will be power if leaning hard on thee. I could not do without thee, O oh Jesus, Savior dear. And when my eyes are holding, I know that thou art near. How dreary and how lonely this changeful life would be without the sweet communion, the secret rest with thee. I could not do without thee, for years are fleeting. Fast. And soon in solemn loneliness the river must be passed. But thou wilt never leave me, and though the waves roll high, I know thou wilt be near me. Spirit is I. Amen. I don't know about you, I couldn't do without him either, could you? He's near and whispers, it is I. I like that. Well, take your Bible with me if you would. Let's go to the Psalms. Psalm 81. Psalm 81 tonight. I'm so glad you've come on a Tuesday night. Appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord and being here. And a privilege to worship the Lord together any day. But uh, I know the holiday week, appreciate your faithfulness to Him. I was reading some about birds today as I read this passage. And uh, basically got to the bottom line and a lot of, lot of information, of course, about birds. Looked at different pictures about birds. The bottom line for baby birds, generally their responsibility while they're in the nest, is to do one thing, and that's to open their mouth. <laughs> Just open their mouth. And you see the baby birds in the picture, and their, their mouth opens bigger than their head is. And that's pretty amazing. I'm not going to ask anyone to demonstrate, but, uh, you know, I mean, they're just, you know, open it. And, uh, and that's what they do. They just sit in the nest, and they wait. Sometimes, mostly, it's mom, but in some species, it's the dad. But uh, that bring the food, and they just sit there with their mouth open until the food drops in. And uh, it's kind of like men on Thanksgiving, I think, about. And, uh, you know, we wait there until the food comes, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and we enjoy it. But uh, that's what they do. They just, their responsibility is to open their mouth. Just open their mouth. Well, Psalm 81, I want to read here together, and I want you to see God uses this thought, and I, I like it. Let's look at verse 1, beginning, Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon. In the time appointed on our solemn feast day. For this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This you ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I understood not. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. 
Thou callest in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord, thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own hearts, lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. But their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. I want to bring you a message tonight titled, Open Thy Mouth Wide. Open Thy Mouth Wide. Verse 10, he says, and I will fill it. Open thy mouth wide. Let's ask the Lord to help us now. Lord, we need you in this hour. Pray you'd help us as we look in your word. Lord, may we learn like the baby bird you created to be that humble, that dependent on our heavenly Father that gives good gifts to them that ask. May we open our mouth wide. Oh, Lord, may we expect great things from God. May we open our mouth wide. Lord, that you may fill it. Forgive us for when we filled our own mouth with lots of other things. May we open it wide to you, Lord, that you may fill it tonight. May we look to you. May we glean from this passage what you'd have us to learn, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at this psalm, of course, the in the beginning there, he speaks of feast, and many attribute uh, this psalm here to the Feast of uh, Trumpets, Feast of Tabernacles there. And he speaks of some of that in the early part. But certainly many principles the Christian can get from this as we think of our God. This psalm reminds us of three different aspects of worship as you go through it. The first five verses talk about praising God, praising His name. We think of thanksgiving and the idea of thanking our God, praising our God for who He is and the great God and what He's provided. He says in verse 1, sing, and I like it, sing aloud. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. God wants to sing aloud, and where it would, it would be loud enough, someone would say, that's some noise, all right? I like that. My wife's been tickled at me for ever since we've been dating. Uh, uh, just when kids and stuff, we go into church somewhere, and people would turn around and look at me. Does that sing loud? I think God wants us to sing loud. He says it. Sing aloud. And I think we should. With all our heart, what's the other hand if I do? Do with all thy might, right? We sing with all our heart. Then verse 2, take a psalm and bring hither the timbre, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow the trumpet in the new moon in the time pointed on the psalm feast day. So we think of the worship of our God, praising his name, thanksgiving, singing, bringing the musicians in, in this part of this, praising him. Then hearing God's word. Verses 6 through 10 uh, speaks of this. Verse 8, zero in on here, O my people, and I'll testify unto thee. O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. It's interesting how the, tense, uh, the, the, the person speaking changes in the beginning, command of sing aloud unto God and uh, all this, and then it's saying, now he's talking. It says, this he ordained in Joseph, but in verse 5 it swaps over. Where Verse 6, I removed his shoulder. Now God speaks the rest of the way. Interesting. Then verses 11 to 16, obeying God's will. Verse 11, but my people would not hearken. And by the way, these are three aspects of wor true worship. Praising, but it doesn't end there. It's not just praising the Lord and that's it. No, you hear then God's word. And then you obey his will. 
And we find that through all through the word of God. We'll look at some more of that in just a minute. But he says in verse 11, but my people would not hearken to my voice. Verse 13, oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. See, part of worship is obedience. By the way, that's how we know some of the so-called worship in some of the churches today is nothing more than an emotional experience in the name of another Jesus, as the Bible calls it. Because they can be comfortable in the bar Saturday night and be just as comfortable the next day and Sunday in what they call their worship. And that's not worship because worship has the idea of becoming before God and knowing Him. And it's a life-changing thing that is lived out in the days following. That's worship. That's what Jesus said, remember? When the devil tempted him, Matthew chapter 4, then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He connected worship with serving. Worship, the time of adoring him, sitting at the feet of Jesus, he connected with an action of serving him. It's not just an experience, it's much more than that. It's uh, the one we're worshiping changes us. You see that with Isaiah when he saw God high and lifted up. What a worship experience he saw. What a worship experience he had. And then he said, Lord, here am I, send me. I'll go, I'll serve. Verse 46 of Luke 6, Jesus said again, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So some worship experience of praise or people get in some emotional thing, that is not worship. It is only true worship if it changes your life, how you live on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. See, that's, and it happens to us too. It can happen in what we would call a worship service that is biblically sound and Christ honoring. It ought to change. It's more than just an event. It ought to change how we live. That's what Jesus says with worship. And it happened with them. They sang to their God. They, they did that, but then God said they wouldn't obey me as you follow this psalm. I want you to see three things from this psalm as we use that as an introduction. Number one, I want you to see simple. God makes it so simple. Look at verse 10. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. He says, I am God. I'm the Almighty. I am the Lord thy God, that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. He makes it so simple. He says, I'm God. I'm the Almighty. Uh, remember how he would remind us in his word, call unto me. And I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Can I refer you back to the bird? Their job is just to open their mouth. Call unto me, God says. I'll do great and mighty. You don't have to do all the great and mighty. You do the calling on me. You do the faith in me. You trust me. I'll do the great and mighty. Remember what the Lord tells us in Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, Jesus would say, without me, ye can do nothing. See, our job is, that's it. Simple. Back to simple Christianity. Simplicity that's in Christ. See, my job is to abide in the vine. That's my job. I'll tell you, the Lord has given all of us a responsibility of the Great Commission, and we are wanting to see people reach with the gospel and are working hard at that in lots of ways. But I want to tell you, it's not our job to build the church. That's his job. He said, I will build my church. Now, I think there's lots of activity that he's given us to do that will do that. But you can do all the activity in the world if you are not abiding in the vine and the power of the vine flowing through you. The light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is not shining through you, activity is not going to do it. See, you can get busy with lots of things, but God wants us to get very simple. The simplicity that's found in Christ Jesus of abiding in the vine. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. I'll fill it. See, he's the one that's able. I'm the almighty God. If you'll just, hey, call unto me, I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. See, we make life so complicated so often, don't we? So complicated. Remember what the Lord told in Hebrews chapter 12? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let, let me tell you about 
the beginning of the story. That's what God's saying. Let me tell you about the beginning. I'm the author. I, I started the story. I'm the, the alpha. I'm the beginning of it. And I'm the one that's going to bring it all the way to the end. I'm going to finish it. He said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, I'm the beginning and the end, I'm the author and the finisher. Look unto me, I'm all of it. <laughs> See, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. And he gave us Hebrews 11 there because he wanted us to go all the way through that chapter and see one truth. All the way through Hebrews 11, he's hammering home one truth, but without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I am the Lord God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Let's believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And all the way through, he's teaching that truth. Look at this one. Without, but by faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Enoch. What is he saying? By looking unto Jesus, by trusting God, by opening our mouth wide, not trying to fill it themselves, letting God do it. Let God fill it. Let God feed you. Let God provide. I am the God that brought you out. And so simple, simple. I think of it practically in our life. I think of finding my wife, Mary. You start getting around college students very much and people get anxious about who they're going to marry. That's an important decision. No doubt about it. I talk, to, I talk to teenagers, talk to young adults. Three most important questions to answer of life. What will you do with Jesus? Number one. Number two, who am I going to marry? Number three, what am I going to do with my life? Those three questions. And they're making them in their teenage into single years. Hopefully they know Christ early on in life. And so the great question, and people get anxious about it, especially you get about senior year in Bible college, people get real anxious about it. And uh, things start moving quickly sometimes, maybe probably too quick perhaps. But I love what Brother Sexton taught us about resting in the will of God in the picture of Adam. Adam fell asleep in the will of God. And the Lord made him a helpmeet and brought her unto him. He opened his mouth wide, so to speak, and let God fill it. He didn't look for a wife. He wasn't running around trying to figure out what, who he was going to marry. Of course, there wasn't anyone else. You, but you can make the connection. He was resting in God's plan. There was only one woman for him, literally, and <laughs> God's plan. See? But you think about Mary, and Mary was born in California. I was born in Oklahoma and went to Canada. I mean, if I would have tried to find Mary, you know, you think about the logistics of that. Uh, she lived in Colorado, lived in Alabama. I lived in York, Saskatchewan, this time in Manitoba, and, and then Simcoe, Ontario, Port Dover, Ontario. And, and uh, you know, then I went to college at Pensacola to start with, and then ended up at Crown and where we met. I could have never worked all that out. I could have never found, if I would have been trying to find a wife, I'd have found something else. I'd have found somewhere else. I'd have never, those paths would have never crossed. But when we keep it simple, that, Lord, it's your choice. Lord, whatever you choose, whatever you have for me. See, trust in God. And God's been good to me and to give me the wife that I have. See, it's simple. We complicate things, don't we? Because we're going to figure out what we're going to have. We're going to figure out what we're going to eat. And, and the bird's supposed to just, the baby bird, he's supposed to just open the mouth. That's all. God will fill it. That's what the Lord's telling us. Simple. See, life gets complicated when we walk our own way. Look at verse 11 and 12. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. See, he tells them in verse 10, let me remind you, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Uh, you, you were there in verse 5, you were in the land of Egypt there. Verse 6, I removed your shoulder from the burden. Your hands were delivered from the pots. You called in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee. He says, I'm that one that brought thee out with a high hand, with, with the might, the power, the defeat of the armies that spoiled the Egyptians. I am that God. He says, open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it, but... Verse 11, my people wouldn't hearken to my voice. We're not going to let you fill it. We're going to get what we want. We're going to eat what we want. We're going to do what we want. We're going to fill our life with what we want. Okay, 
Israel would none of me, verse 12, so I gave them up unto their own heart's lust. And they walked in their own counsels. So God said, okay, you can have what you want. I'm going to tell you, you keep after something, keep after something, and God says no, and God says no, and God says no. Sometimes God says, okay, go ahead. You have what you want. You can have it. Like Israel, they were a theocracy. God was their king. We want a king. We're not happy with you, God. We want a king like every other country. You're a special nation. You're my nation. You're my people. I called you out. I made you a nation from Abraham. And I brought you into this land. And I gave it to you. And 70 people went to Egypt. And I brought you out two and a half million. And all that I did. And we want a king. Finally, God said, okay. But I'll tell you, he's going to take your daughters to wife and maids. He's going to take your sons to fight and battles and to serve him. And be horsemen and on and on. But okay. And they got what they wanted. They got Saul. Head and shoulders above everybody. Oh, he was an impressive king. So I gave them up, verse 12, unto their own heart's lust. And they walked in their own counsels. Oh, what they got. Oh, what they got. You remember what happened to the children of Israel? We're not going in there. Those giants are going to kill us. Those giants, we're not going to the promised land. They're, they'll eat us there. We're like grasshoppers. They'll kill us. We're going to die if we go in there. So what did they get? They went back to the wilderness. They got what they wanted. What happened in the wilderness? They all died. They all died. See, simple faith would have led them in. You think about what God's plan was for them. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. God says, okay, you can have what you want. Their heart's lust is just not necessarily, lust doesn't always have a connotation of immorality. It just means want. They got what they wanted. They walked in their own counselors. They didn't take God's way, they took their way. Verse 13, 14, I want you to see not just first simple, but second, soon. Soon. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. Think about it. By their time should have, but their time should have endured forever. Think about it. Think about what happened to them. Forty years wandering. Forty years of nothing accomplished. Forty years of what are you doing? It's an 11-day journey. What are you all doing in the wilderness? Here they're wandering. Here they're wandering. God said, if you'd obeyed me, oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways, I should soon have subdued their enemies. Soon. He could have accomplished and defeated. How long did it take him to beat Egypt? Here they are overnight. They walk through the Red Sea and the chariots and the powerful army of Egypt. And God beat them all in the Red Sea. Soon I could have defeated those. Seven days they walk around Jericho, this great fortress, as they laugh, as they watch. <laughs> what are they going to do? How are they going to get in? Where is their great engines of war? And God knocks the walls down. Soon, soon he could have done it. The plan for Jericho. What did he do as they go through the wilderness? He didn't wipe them all out in one word. He could have. But God moved them out slowly so the beasts wouldn't take over the land. He said, I'll keep them working the fields for you. I'll keep the vineyards tended for you and slowly move the enemy out and you can take it. He kept it nice. He kept the houses not broken down and filled with bears or lions or some animal and living in them. And he moved them out slowly. What did he use? Hornet. <laughs> different things. Can you imagine? God said, soon you would have had all this. But you wouldn't take my way. You wouldn't hearken unto my voice. And they didn't have it 40 years. They never had it in their lifetime. Think about it. God in a moment can speak a word into your life, to your situation, and change everything. 
Can you get the picture of the birds in the nest? They're helpless. You ever seen one out on the ground? You, you can't hardly help them. The mother, you touch them, they say they need scent. They won't. I mean, they're helpless. You know a squirrel or something's going to get them, or, a, you know, something's going to, a snake or a fox, something's going to get that. I mean, they're helpless. But they stay in the nest. The only thing they can do is, and that's it. The Lord takes care of everything else. The bird, the mom takes care of everything else. They just open their mouth. That's all. Open their mouth. It's like trying to feed kids sometimes when they're little and they're a baby. They don't know what they want or need and hear, you know, trying to, but they won't open their mouth, you know, and they're trying to stick it in. It's all rubbing off the spoon and, you know, you're trying to push their lip down and jam some in there and, you know, and finally you get to find some baby food they'll eat or something. You know, God says, open your mouth. Open it wide and I'll do something that you won't imagine what I can do. In a moment, he can change everything soon. You say, well, you don't know my situation. You don't know what I'm dealing with. Hey, God can soon, he can soon change it. Soon. He used the hornet. Uh, he, I mean, seven days, Jericho was no more. Soon. See, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thought. Can't you hear the Lord? His great love. This was his wife, Israel. We're his bride, his great love, Jesus would say to the Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as he wept, How often I gathered thee under my wings as a hen gathered chicks. But you would not. Think about it. Think about what the Lord wants to do. Can you hear verse 13? Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. What would the Lord do in your life? What would the Lord do with your life if you would allow Him? If you'd open your mouth wide, say, Lord, I'm wide open. Whatever you want, I'm yours. You fill it. You take it. You, you fill my days. You fill my years with what you'd have. See, we need to get simple, don't we? Simply obey Him, and soon God can use you beyond what you'd ever imagine, exceeding abundantly above. Oh, I ask or think. And then thirdly, last in line, once you notice verse 15, 16, thirdly, satisfied. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. Satisfied. Here they are, 40 years, wandering in the desert, wandering in the wilderness, unsatisfied at every turn. We want water. Where's water? We can't have nothing to drink. We would have been back, better back in Egypt. Every turn. We're sick of this manna. Every turn. We want that quail. We wish for the fish and the leeks. And unsatisfied. God said, oh, I would have satisfied you. Oh, you want to be satisfied in life? Think of this world trying to grab at everything to get satisfied, to finally have enough. You want to get satisfied in life? God saying to the people of Israel, I would have satisfied you. God wants to satisfy you. He says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he will give thee the desires of thine heart. You'll be satisfied, finally satisfied. The Bible says the eyes of man are never satisfied. So the only satisfaction of life is found in the Lord. He's the only one that can satisfy. Only God can satisfy. They asked millionaires of the past, how much more money to make you happy? Just a little more. Just a little more. Yeah, never satisfied. And we never will be. And God says, I can satisfy you. I want you to notice verse 7, he mentions a place, Meribah. I prove thee at the waters of Meribah. Meribah is found in Exodus 17. I won't go there, though. Let's go to Numbers 20. Would you hold your place? We'll come back. We're going to finish up here. Numbers chapter 20. In Exodus 17, God calls it Meribah. There is the first place where they needed water. And God says, smite the rock, Moses. And water comes out. Use the rod of God and smite the rock. And just the rest of Exodus 17, they're fighting. And he's on the hill holding up the rod of God. Numbers 20, they're back at Meribah. If you begin reading there in verse 1, look at it. Then came the children of Israel, even unto the whole congregation, to the desert of Zin in the first month. 
And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there. Here they're in the years of wandering. It's buried there. Nearing the end of it all, and there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses, against Aaron. The people trod with Moses and spake, saying, Would God we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? Why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord in the wilderness, under this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It's no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And you can I only imagine Moses and them saying, we wanted to go in. You wouldn't go in with a place that was full of milk and honey. There's nothing here. There's no water, nothing. Verse 6, and Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, take the rod and gather thou the assembly together. Numbers 20, verse 8. Thou and Aaron, thy brethren, speak ye unto the rock. Notice, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. It shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out. I always thought this word was interesting. The water came out abundantly. Abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye should not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. In fact, Aaron's going to die before the chapter ends. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. And Moses... Can't go in. He broke the picture, and I've heard that all my life, but if you go to John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39, you see Jesus there. In fact, Jesus, in, in their feast of trumpets, or tabernacles, they'd pour out water on the ground. And here they are, the last day of the feast, the Bible says in John 7, 37 to 39, and Jesus stands up, the rock. Fulfilling the picture. See, he wanted you to speak to him. Speak to the rock. In the last day, that great day of the feast, John 7, 37, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture is said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. It's a great picture. They would pour out at the end of that feast water, remembering this water. And Jesus stood up and said, hey, you want water? Come unto me. I've got living water. Out of the rock comes the water. I love that picture. But that's not what I'm getting to in this with Meribah. You think of what God's saying to them in verse 16 of back in Psalm 81. He should have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey out of the rock. Should I have satisfied thee? Honey. Out of the rock. I wanted to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Honey. If you'd have just opened your mouth wide, you're begging for water. You're thirsty, needing just water, the, the basic need of life. He said, You'd have had way more water than you needed. You'd have had honey coming out of the rock. <laughs> Think of it. I'd have satisfied thee. Now, I wouldn't have just got you the bare minimum and just enough to live. He said, I'd have had honey flowing out of the rock for you. You wouldn't have just had manna. If you can see the picture, verse 16, he should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. See, we've got a lot to be thankful for. Our God says, if you'll open your mouth wide, the spiritual blessings of God, I mean, he'll fill it. Why are we hungry? Why are we parched? Why are we lacking? God says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled. We won't open our mouth. We won't look to him in faith and trust. He'll satisfy. No one satisfies like the Lord. 
The Bible talks about Hebrews 11, about the pleasures of sin for a season. But in Psalm 16, the God's, God says that in His presence, there are pleasures forevermore. In His presence, there's joy. Satisfied. Pleasures forevermore. Imagine working everything out to marry Mary. I'd have picked the wrong one. I'd have messed up. I'd have, I'd have done the wrong thing. But wait on God, fall asleep. In the will of God, He'll satisfy. Oh, verse 16 says, the finest honey, the finest honey, <laughs> the finest of the wheat and honey out of the rock. Yeah. Conclusion tonight, I read about the Canadian thistle. I dealt with this when we were in Canada farming. The Canadian thistle is one of the most destructive weeds the crop farmers deal with there. In fact, it's got an extensive root system. And that Canadian thistle makes it extremely difficult to eradicate it once it gets established. It goes 15 feet deep, the root, and can go just as wide, the thistle. Not only does it mess up your crops, but because of the root and the plants, just 20 thistles in one square mile, think of this, just 20 thistles in one square mile of field can reduce barley yield by a third reduce alfalfa yield by one half. And so Canadian thistle is very damaging. In fact, the livestock won't eat it, won't feed near it. So lots of damage the Canadian thistle does when it sets up. It fills up the ground, half production, a third production lost. You think of God's people today and think of the lack of productivity. Think of what God had in mind for Israel and what he would have done. And think of what God has in mind for us and what God wants to do. But we get filled up, our fields filled up, our mouths filled up with something else. And he says, open their mouth wide and I will fill it. I'll fill it. I'll bring the water out of the rock abundantly. You thirst? Hey, come to me. I'll satisfy. You think of that parable of the sower and the Bible talked about the thorns. How the cares of this world took away the productivity. How the deceitfulness of riches takes away the productivity of the word of God in the life. Crowds out God's word. You think about God's Christians today. Think about the lack of productivity by God's people because of the thorns, because of the cares of the world in their life, because of the riches, the deceitfulness of riches. People working overtime so they can make enough money and they throw their money in a bag with holes, the Bible says. Oh yeah, we've got to work Sunday and work this and work that. We've got to make an extra money to pay the bills and they've got more bills. And now they get a divorce and they've got to pay for two houses now because of they went away from God. He would have satisfied. Because they had to make extra money, so they got away from God, so their marriage went down the tubes further when it was already. Think about it. Simplicity that's in Christ. I love what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Open thy mouth wide, and I'll fill it. Jesus said, hey, you just follow me. Come unto me. That's it. That's right. Just follow me. Just come to me. Open thy mouth wide, and I'll fill it. Just look to me. Trust me. Call on me. So simple, doesn't he? The simplicity that's in Christ. The devil wants to make it so complicated. We've got to do this and that. I'll tell you, there'll be lots of doing this and that, but it's so simple because it all starts by just abiding in the vine. God will do through us way more than we could ever do for him if God would be allowed to fill us. So this Thanksgiving, as we have a couple of days, maybe you have a little more time to consider. Think about getting back. Let's get back to the simplicity that's in Christ. The simple faith life. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. Let them fill you with spiritual blessing. Abide in the vine. Obedient, in sync, in step with Jesus Christ. The vine, living, just simple obedience. 
Simple. Soon. Soon God wants to do something in your life. And satisfied. You can work all you want. You can, you can shake everything and move everything that'll move. You can kick, stomp, push, shove. And you can go all the way through your life and be unsatisfied. Because no money, no position, it doesn't last. No house, no car, nothing is going to satisfy. But God says, let me make it simple for you. The Heavenly Father, he knows how to give good gifts to them that ask. <laughs> ask, and I'll provide. <laughs> See, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those complicated things. He said, all that, I'll take care of that. All those things will be added unto you. Let's bow our head.